Welcome back to our series, The Church, Be What You Are. Today we'll be looking at the means of grace within the church. For some, you may not be familiar with this terminology, but for many, those words in that order may seem out of place or odd. Maybe when you hear the means of grace within the church, you simply get confused or clock out. But I wanna encourage you to clock in so that you may gain a greater clarity about what this means, but also having a growing conviction of the importance of the means of grace within the church. Let me start with a definition of the means of grace, defined as this. The means of grace are any activities within the fellowship of the church that God uses to give more grace to Christians. Let me read that once again. The means of grace are any activities within the fellowship of the church that God uses to give more grace to Christians. When I think of grace, I often think of God's giving us what we don't deserve and could never earn. It's God's unmerited favor upon our lives. In order to live the abundant life that God desires, I need an abundant amount of God's grace. But not just I, we, we as the church need God's grace. Essentially, all blessings we experience in life are ultimately undeserved. They are all of God's grace. So why wouldn't we want to tap into God's grace and soak in as much as possible, both individually and corporately as a church body? 1 Peter 5.12 indicates that the entire church life, Christian life, is to be lived by grace, and we are to stand firm in that. As Christians, God calls us into the body of believers, and there are numerous blessings as a result of joining together. Having said that, to neglect the involvement of means of grace, we are forfeiting God's blessing as we miss out on some of his graces he desires to pour out upon us. You might be asking, well, how do I miss out? Well, if God calls us to walk, talk, pray, worship, dwell together in unity, and we live unto ourselves with little to no thought for the church body, what does that say? It says we want to live life our way rather than walk in obedience with God and God's people. God's abundant grace is outpoured upon those who are obedient, those who live by faith in what God declares through his word. Keeping that in mind, if I said, there is a genuine fountain of youth, wouldn't you wanna run to that? If I discovered an endless pot of gold, wouldn't you want to know where that's at? If I knew of a Burger King giving away free Whoppers for life, would you not say, crown me the king of unlimited Whoppers? Well, maybe not, but if I said, there is great grace to be attained for you within the church. Wouldn't you want to get in on that grace? God's unmerited favor? The answer should be a resounding yes. With that in mind, we are going to be looking at a few means of grace that will help us fuel us as we look to move forward as a church body. Our time is limited, so our focus will be limited as well. I'm sure we could develop an exhaustive list, but today we will just focus on a few. In the next two sessions, we will discuss baptism and the Lord's table, both of which are wonderful means of grace that we will not touch on in today's session. Our aim today is to briefly look at the following means of grace. They are not in any particular order. Teaching of God's word, worship as a whole, prayer for one another, and the giving of our tithes and offerings. All of these are available to believers within the church. The Holy Spirit works through all of them to bring various kinds of blessings to individuals and the church body as well. Before we dive into the short list of means of grace, I wanna pause and bring clarity to those who may have a Catholic background or upbringing because the, the terminology may sound familiar, but the definitions are distinctively different. They greatly contrast each other. The Roman Catholic Church has traditionally believed that God's grace comes to people only through the official ministry of the church, particularly through the priest of the church. Therefore, when it specifies the means of grace, what it calls the sacraments, those are available to people within the church. It has the view of activities that are supervised and or performed only by the priest of the church. 
The Catholics view their seven sacraments or their means of grace as a means of salvation that makes people fit to receive justification from God. But the Protestant view in which we hold to and discuss today is merely the means of grace that are simply means of additional blessings within the Christian life and do not gain our justification for that happened upon the moment of our salvation, trusting in Christ. Catholics teach that the means of grace imparts grace whether or not they are subject to faith on the part of the minister or the recipient. This is a works-based salvation obtained through the religious rituals, while Protestants hold that God only imparts grace when there is faith on the part of the person receiving these means, which I'm sure we could get into in the next session as to why we don't practice infant baptism. For today's purposes, simply know that our list of the means of grace are activities that are for the genuine born-again believer. The means of grace are to be done in faith, through obedience, while in accordance with the Holy Spirit. With that in mind, means of grace number one that we're going to look at is the teaching of the word. Even before we became Christians, the word of God as preached and taught brings God's grace to them. That is the instructions of God using to impart spiritual life. Romans 1.16 states that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.24 states the preaching of Christ is the power of God and wisdom of God. 1 Peter 1.23 indicates we have been born anew, not of perishable seed, of imper- but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. But once we become believers, it is the word of God that is able to build us up, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Jesus indicated in Matthew 4, 4, that God's word is absolutely necessary for spiritual nourishment and maintaining spiritual life. It's the word of God that convicts of sin and turns us to righteousness. It's the word of God that gives direction and guidance. It's the word of God that grants wisdom in the midst of uncertainty. It's the, it's the word of God that grants hope in times of hopelessness. God's word speaks of God's power and it reveals his purpose. In Acts 6, 7, Acts 12, 24, and Acts 13, 49, we see God's word increased, grew, multiplied, and spread. And we see the grace of God at work through the word of God being proclaimed. The Bible is the primary means of grace that God gives his people. If there is no proclamation of God's word, then there is no salvation and therefore no sanctification, and we remain darkened in our trespasses, dead in our sin. So yeah, the word of God is pretty essential. God's word is at the forefront as a means to bring forth God's grace. So we have the preaching of God's word, Sunday school, Sunday morning, the teaching in small groups, biblical counseling, why? To bring light, God's light, to bring life to those that are dead in their own trespasses. The word of God is so essential. If you and I, if we want God's grace, we need to get saturated in the word of God through the different avenues that the church provides to us. It's ultimately for your good and puts you and I in a good place to receive God's grace. Means of grace number two, worship as a whole. Genuine worship is worship in spirit. John 4, 23 through 24, Philippians 3, 3, which probably means that it is the spiritual realm of activity, not the merely outwork physical action of our attendance at a worship service or the singing of songs. Let me read that again. Genuine worship is worship in spirit, which probably means worship that is in the spiritual realm of activity, not merely the outward physical action of attendance at a worship service or the singing of songs. When we enter that spiritual realm of activity and, the min- and minister to the Lord in worship, God also seeks to minister to us. Acts 13.2 highlights the work of the Holy Spirit within the church as they fasted and prayed. 2 Chronicles 5.13-14 indicates when God's people worshipped, he came in a very visible way to dwell in their midst. Similarly, in James 4.8 
It calls us to draw close to God, and he will draw close to us. When we come to worship, it's not merely two hours of our Sunday morning. It's a means of God and his grace to meet with us in a very real, special, and unique way. We ought to prioritize our lives, orchestrate our calendars around the time of worship, for it is a place and time where God can pour out his grace upon us. The third means of grace that I want us to look at is prayer for one another. Corporate prayer within the church as it assembles and prayer by the church members for one another are powerful means which the Holy Spirit uses daily to bring blessing to Christians within the church. Certainly we are to pray together as well as individually following the example of the early church in Acts chapter 4. A unique filling of the Holy Spirit was brought about in Acts 4.31, which brought a boldness to proclaim the word of God. This all came about as a means of them praying together. If prayer from the church is not simply the mouthing of words without heartfelt intentions, but is the genuine expression of our hearts and the reflection of sincere faith, then we should expect that the Holy Spirit will bring a great blessing through it. Certainly when prayer is done in spirit, it involves fellowship with the Holy Spirit and therefore a ministry of the Holy Spirit to the people praying. And Hebrews 4.16 reminds us that we are to draw near to God in prayer before the throne of grace. Why do we do this? So that we might receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So on Sunday morning, as we work through numerous prayers, as we have special prayer meetings, it's not merely a filling of time. It's a needful time that we ought not neglect, for we are doing so with the intent to discover mercy and grace on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of others. There may be times when you or someone else truly needs an extra dose of mercy or grace. So we collectively go before God's throne room through a means of prayer to receive more grace. The fourth and final means of grace that we're going to look at today is the means of grace number four, the giving of our tithes and offerings. We could focus on our time or our talents, but that would fall under the category of personal ministry to individuals and spiritual gifts. So for our short time, I'll simply have us consider the giving of our tithes and offerings to benefit others for the furtherance of the kingdom. Giving is ordinarily done through the church as it receives and distributes the gifts to the various ministries and needs uh, that are cared for by the church. Like in previous items, there's no automatic or mechanical bestowing of benefits to those who give. So don't hear me saying or talking about a prosperity gospel. Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8.20 was actually strongly rebuked for thinking he could obtain a gift of God with money. But if giving is done in faith, out of a commitment to Christ and love for his people, then certainly there will be great blessings in it. It is most pleasing to God when gifts of money are accomplished by the intensification of the giver's own personal commitment to God. This was the case of the Macedonians who first gave themselves to the Lord by the will of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. And they gave to the poor Christians of Jerusalem. And when giving is done joyfully, not reluctantly or under compulsion, there is a great reward of God's favor with it, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul looks at the giving of money to the Lord's work as a spiritual sowing that will lead to a harvest. And Paul expects that all the Corinthians give rightly to God and he will bless them. In your small group time, I'd love for you to consider 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12, in looking at this passage and aspect of giving of our tithes and offering. Rather than seeing giving as an unpleasant obligation, we would do well to view it as a rich means of grace within the church and to expect that through it, the Holy Spirit will bring blessing. As we close, I wanted to quickly touch base on some means of grace that we were not able to mention in depth today. Evangelism to the lost. You know, it is a wonderful means for us to proclaim the gospel, not just on an individual level, but to actually come alongside others as well and join in the work of the Holy Spirit. Another one is church discipline, a means to correct and purify the church. 
It is the means of reconciling believers to one another and to God. While it may not reap immediate blessings, yet the long term is beneficial for the church body as it puts them in a place to receive God's grace upon the church body. Spiritual gifts. God has gifted all of us uniquely and individually, not for the benefit of you alone, but for the benefit of the church body. This is for all of us to enjoy and to also get in the means of God's grace. Another one would be the fellowship, one with another. Fellowship is not about food and fun, although those might be components. Fellowship is about engaging with our church family. It's not about your interest in the activity. It's about taking an interest in the needs of others. And the last one I'll mention is this, personal ministry to individuals. You know, we are called to be making disciples, mentoring others, and investing in others within our church body, and as a church body to those outside the church. Oftentimes the task may seem consuming of our time, maybe even daunting, and yet it is through your willingness to give of yourself in which God gives you the grace to do what you cannot. I wanna close with an illustration. Imagine if I had in my hand an electrical outlet. By itself, it has no electrical output. If it is connected to a black, white, and copper wire, which goes into the electrical power breaker box, the electrical outlet now has the potential to put out electricity to some electronic that gets plugged in. Now pretend for a moment that the electrical outlet represents the people of the church and the ministries of the church. By themselves, they lack the grace of God. But if these people of God and these ministries of God are looking to link with the word of God in faith, the work of God through the Holy Spirit, the worship of God in obedience, they then get connected to the power source of God's grace. And as a result, these people and these ministries are now in a good position to receive the outpouring of God's grace. So, you want in on the means of grace that God is offering? Seek to get plugged in to the people of God. Seek to get connected with the different ministries of God. And then simply seek to receive his abundant and overflow of God's grace as he sees fit. Lord bless you, my friends, as you embrace these means of grace.